Hello everyone, welcome to the masonry part of the course. Uh, as discussed, I'm going to try to make these online video, uh, these uh, virtual videos for you guys so that we can explain the slides. Um, I'm going to do the masonry introduction course uh, part in two, two parts. Um, and uh, let's get to it. So, <clears throat> the in this part we'll have an introduction, we'll have a brief history of masonry, we're going to talk about early history of masonry material, early building elements, early developments of building structure, uh, contemporary masonry elements, uh, contemporary masonry building systems. Uh, there are going to be a lot of terminologies and, and a lot of pictures, uh, so this should be interesting, so let's get to it. So the term masonry refers to construction using bricks or natural stone. Uh, stone may be used in its natural state as found or it may be shaped. Uh, masonry is usually built uh, using mortar but many ancient structures were built without it. Uh, the term masonry actually includes mass concrete but engineers tend to reserve it wholly for brick and stone masonry. Um, prior to the 19th century masonry was the only available form of construction for major buildings. Reinforced concrete and steels were not, not developed until later half of the 19th century. Uh, masonry is a very ancient building material. Stone lined pits remain from the Stone Age almost 2,000 years ago. In Sumeria, almost 5,000 years ago. Houses three stories high were built from clay and straw, formed in one foot square uh, blocks, and dried in the sun. Uh, in the 18th century, saw so improvement in masonry bridge design. It was recognized that segments of circles were more structurally efficient and full circles were used by Romans and later copied by medieval builders. Um, later on, curves approximating the parabola were developed and you got more building structures. So, just to show you some of the examples of masonry construction, uh, you have the Stone Age ring in England, uh, extremely old uh, concrete uh, masonry structure using uh, lintels. And uh, then you have uh, Egyptian pyramids located in the Giza. That's another example of uh, stone construction. You can even see that they had limestone veneer on top. Uh, we'll talk about veneer like later on in this uh, in this introduction section. Uh, in the f in 200 BC, they started building the Great Wall of China, uh, and it lasted. It construction lasted in 1640 AD. Um, that was all um, built by brick and stone. Uh, the pyramid of Chichen Itza in Mexico also built uh, was around 700 and 900 AD. Uh, they also built with stone construction or masonry construction. Then you have the Roman adequates, uh, aqueducts and bridges. Those aqueducts were built uh, for water or transporting water uh, and you can see they also built bridges. The Romans built bridges and uh, this was so that they could get across the rivers and uh, land masses. Then you had Gothic church construction which uh, sort of revolutionized uh, uh, construction. Uh, I will talk about it later in this course. Then you have St. Peter's P uh, Paul and St. Peter's and St. Paul's Cathedral domes. Then became dome construction. Um, also Taj Mahal which was also similar to a dome construction. It was built in 1630 and 1653. Um, then we're coming to the 19th century. Uh, here you can see a 16 story, 16 -story brick uh, building which is a hotel. Uh, this was all built in masonry. You also have hotels in uh, Pasadena uh, in nine, it was built in 1971. This is a 13-story uh, masonry construction. And since Canada is a comp comparatively young nation and our masonry heritage only goes back uh, a few year a few years, early settlers uh, who brought their building skills built these structures. So you have the Parliament Building. You have a lot of buildings in Ottawa and Quebec City where you see older masonry construction. We don't have a very uh, as many prehistoric construction as do Roman uh, or European construction. Okay, so now going into early history of masonry material. 
Um, many materials have been used for construction of masonry with those locally available being the most common. The common masonry material used in the past were stone, clay units, calcium silicate units, concrete masonry units, and mortars. Uh, we're going to describe each of these and we'll go into the detail of what type of um, material was used. The stone, the stone material. The first masonry was a crude stack of select stone. Uh, sedimentary rocks of mainly sandstone and limestone were split along their natural bedding planes using picks, crowbars, and wedges and were dressed to size with a chisel. Smaller stones were used in place of mortar and for bedding. So mortar is the material that's used to combine two pieces of rock. So now there's a lot of different type of stone masonry because uh, as it was used uh, extensively in the past you have random rubble, rubble coursed, random ashlar and coarse ashlar. We'll go into some detail about uh, of rubble and ashlar. So the classification of stone masonry um, you have basically rubble masonry and ashlar masonry. In rubble masonry you have random uh, rubble which is coarse uncoursed you have square rubble, which is also coarse, uncoarse, uh, polygonal uh, rubble, flint rubble, and dry rubble. In the ashlar masonry, you have ashlar fine, ashlar rough, rock or quarry faced, and ashlar blocked. As we go along, uh, you'll see the differences between rubble and ashlar. So, so random rubble masonry. Uh, the coarse uh, masonry was in this type of masonry. The stones used are of widely different sizes. This is the roughest and cheapest form of stone masonry. In the coarse random rubble masonry, the masonry work is carried out in courses such that the stone is a particular course of equal height. So you can see here um, the stones uh, are different uh, type of stones that are being used and they're just stacked on top of each other and they're making layers with it. So. Uncoursed. In this type of masonry, the stones used are of widely different sizes. This is roughest and cheapest form of stone masonry. In uncoursed random rubble masonry, the courses are not maintained regularly. Uh, the larger stones are laid first and the spaces between them are filled up by means of spalls or skates. So they do not have courses like if when you looked at the coursed one, they, they had different courses. Uh, in uncoursed, they're just piled up and formed to work together. Then you have square rubble masonry. In this type of masonry, stores have stones having straight bend and size are used and stones are usually square, right? Uh, and brought to hammer, dressed or straight cut finish. In the coarse square rubble masonry, the work is carried out in courses of varying depths. So you can see here um, in the coarse masonry that it's being done on at different levels on the select section view you can see it on different levels in the uncoursed in this type of masonry stores having stained beds are uh, are usually squared in the uncoursed square rubble masonry the different sizes of stones having straight edges and sides are arranged on the face to several irregular patterns so uncoursed there is no pattern it's all irregular compared to coarse coarse has pattern uncoursed has no pattern Polygon, polygonal rubble masonry. Uh, in this type of rubble masonry, the stones are hammer dressed. The stones used for face work are dressed in an irregular polygonal shape. So you can see here, uh, whatever shape the stone comes in, they just uh, they pile it together, and they make um, f make it fit in like a jigsaw puzzle. Thus, the face joints are are seen running in an irregular fashion in all directions. So, you can see here uh, the polygonal rubble masonry. Flint rubble masonry. Uh, in this type of masonry, stone used are flints or cobbles. Uh, these are irregularly shaped modules of silica. The stones are extremely hard, but they're brittle, therefore they break easily. Uh, this uh, is not. Um, this was usually used uh, to as veneer walls and not too much as structural walls, or it didn't actually work too much. 
dry rubble masonry. In this type of masonry, mortar is not used uh, in the joints. This type of construction is cheapest. It requires more skill though in construction. This may be used for non-load bearing walls such as compound walls. And you can see here that they're just stacked stones. But you have to be very skilled to find the right type of stone, the right size, and to cut these stones. So ashlar masonry, uh, ashlar masonry, in this type of ashlar masonry, each stone is cut to uniform size. So I mean, in ashlar masonry, everything is uniform size. Uh, uniform size shape with all sides rectangular so that the stone gives perfectly horizontal and vertical joints. And this type of ashlar masonry is very costly, uh, the fine ashlar masonry. Then you have the ashlar rough, ashlar rough tooled masonry. In this type of ashlar masonry, the beds and the sides are finely chiseled, um, chiseled dress, but the face is made rough by means of tools. A strip about 25 millimeter wide and made by means of chisel is provided around the perimeter of the bed. So this 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 strip here, you can see in between the mortar. That's all the, the chiseled section. Ashlar rock or quarry face masonry. So in this type of ashlar masonry, a strip of about 25 millimeter wide is made by means of chisel is provided around the perimeter of every stone, as in the case of rough tool masonry, but the remaining portion of the face is left in the same form as received from the quarry. So if, it, if, it, if the quarry sends the this rock or you receive the rock from the quarry uneven, in the face masonry, we just use it uneven. In the previous one, rough tool masonry, we were even tooling the face so that it's the same. But when we're talking, talking about face masonry, it's the rock is as is brought from the, the quarry. Ashlar chamfered masonry. This type of ashlar masonry is as, uh, the strip is provided as below, but it is chamfered or beveled at an angle of 45 degrees by means of chisel for a depth of about 25 mils. So this, uh, you can see, is chiseled at 45 degree, uh, at least 25 mils into the stone. So that's called chamfered masonry. Then you have the ashlar back in coarse masonry. But basically, this is a combination of rubble masonry and ashlar masonry. In this type of masonry, the face work is provided with rough tooled or hammer dressed stones and backing of the wall may be made in rubble masonry. So in the front, you'll see uh, very square face stones, but in the back, it'll be rubble masonry or irregular stones used. Clay units. Now, clay brick uh, has been in use for the last uh, at least uh, 10,000 years and possibly for as long as 12,000 years. Sun-dried bricks were widely used in Babylon, Egypt, Spain, South America, the Indian lands of the United States and elsewhere. The earliest bricks were made by pressing mud or clay into small lumps, sometimes cigar shaped and allowed them to dry in the air or sun. So they would put uh, clay materials <coughs> in molds like these and uh, then it would, they would let it sun dry to be used later. So the clay units, these, this is the type of mold that would be used for clay units. Calcium silicates units. Calcium silicate sand lime bricks were made in ancient times by molding lime mortar into brick shape and allowing them to dry in air. Since air drying was a slow process with advancement in steam technology, calcium silicate bricks were cured under steam pressure for rapid production. Calcium silicate bricks have been used in most countries and continue be, to be manufactured using sand and lime and water. So even now, if you, you can find calcium silicate units um, widely used for uh, veneer, brick veneer, uh, you'll see a lot of sand lime bricks being used for brick veneer. Concrete masonry units. Uh, this is the, the one that we're going to study a lot in this course. Uh, but this is an older one. The concrete masonry units were first made in the mid-1800s mid as better quality cements were developed. The first blocks were unpopular because they were solid and heavy to handle. Uh, techniques to make hollow blocks in, in wooden molds developed around 1866. A fairly dry mix of sand, uh, cement and water was placed in the mold and tamped by hand. So, now the we the one we're using these days are hollow brick structures and we're going to talk about them later in the course. 
So basically, our course is going to revolve around these hollow brick structures, and we're going to learn how to design um, structures based on hollow brick uh, mace, concrete masonry units. Mortars. Uh, the mortar is basically what is used to um, in between two layers of bricks. It's a bonding agent. Is what it is. Early mortars were primarily used uh, to fill cracks and to provide uniform bedding for masonry units. Such mortars might have been clay, bitumen, or clay straw mixtures. Their weathering process characteristics depended on uh, very much on local exposure and conditions. The Greeks and Romans added lime and water with the addition of sand and crushed stone or brick, creating the earliest type of concrete. So while they were doing all these mixtures, that's how they came up with the, uh, the earliest type of concrete. <clears throat> So now we're going to talk about uh, early building elements. Um, there are two fundamental structural problems when building. And one is how to achieve height and how to span an opening. Uh, the former is achieved in masonry construction by using columns, towers, and walls. And the later is used by using lintels, beams, and arches. Now we're going to talk about the different tow columns, towers, uh, walls, lintel, and beams in the course. So pyramids. The simplest way of building is to stack masonry units one upon the other. The first crude pyramids were made in 3000 BC by Egyptians which were made uh, mud brick tombs called mastabas. So these are mud brick tombs that were called mastabas. They were used, they're basically stacking and they're going in as they stack, right? So in 18, in 2580 BC Egyptians used dressed stone laid in uh, mortar to build the Great Pyramid. So you can see the bit great pyramids. All they did was <coughs> they started from the outside and they started stacking stone to build up. <coughs> the great uh, the pyramids are almost 147 meters. And that, was, that was the highest structure back then until the Eiffel Tower was built. Um, walls with vertical faces contain much less material than pyramid construction. Uh, early stone walls range from rubble masonry to ashlar masonry. As you can hear, you can see an old uh, wall construction here. The stability of the wall can be understood in terms of a thrust line along the center of gravity of the structure. So along the center of gravity, as we go along the top, it, it, uh, it's wider at the bottom and it's narrower at the top. And so you can see the stability of wall is critical at the base and therefore is larger as largest at the base and the center of gravity is somewhere in the middle and the taller it gets you have to maintain the center of gravity so you can't make a wall going this way you have to make it going upwards and maintaining the center of gravity columns and towers early columns were hollow structures uh, where the perimeter walls enclose central spaces Medieval towers were massive and therefore a high compressive stress was imposed on the foundation which uh, led to the lean. Uh, so you, one of the famous one is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You can see inside the Leaning Tower of Pisa is hollow but uh, because it was so heavy it started to lean. But now um, it ha the foundation has settled enough and it does it's not leaning anymore. And here is another example of an old tower um, in the Roman tower that was built with stone. Uh, spanning across, so beams or lintels. Uh, horizontal space is, is most easily spanned by placing a beam across an opening. So by placing a beam, like here, you can span the, the, an opening. Uh, but you have to use, uh, primitive men use the same technique by balancing a stone across two other stones. So you need to have two stones. You have to make sure these stones are big enough or stable enough to take the weight of the beam on top. This would be used, uh, this would produce compressive stresses at top and tensile stresses at the bottom. Since stone is weak in tension, a large stone is required to span a small opening. So to a small opening like this, you need big rocks <clears throat> because uh, of the tensile uh, stresses at the bottom. Uh, primitive arches, um, a greater span is possible in bending and then can be achieved in an inclined stone slab. So uh, it doesn't show here, but primitive arches, arches had two stones lined up like that, and then they had the support at the bottom. 
So uh, those that was another way of widening the span that it could uh, of the opening. Then came uh, corbelled arches. Corbelled arches were actually the start of the arch technology. Subsequent courses of stability is similar to building pyramids, but uh, just op openings inside. Subsequent courses of stone or bricks on each side of the opening are placed until they meet in the middle. Uh, the weight of the additional courses are res resisted by arching action of the corbel masonry. <coughs> uh, because of its inherent limitation, it never developed to span more than three meters. So it, it, it did not, uh, this, this corbel technology didn't work too well um, because of the limitations of the stonework, but later on, um, it did uh, help in building better uh, technology. So from the corbel structure, um, the corbel R structure became the two arches. A significant structural advantage was made in the introduction of the first two arches. Uh, these were built by wedge-shaped stones or bricks called boisers, uh, arranged to make a semicircle. This kind of construction had the potential to span large distances. So by using wedge-shaped stone, they were able to uh, span larger distances. So they used to have vertical support and they have a keystone. So the top stone is always called the keystone. And these were the weezers, weezers that are stones that are wedge-shaped. Wedge uh, in closing spaces, um, you had barrel walls. Early vaulted elements were constructed by corbling technique. Again, we were using the same technique. Uh, the upper course of the two parallel walls were progressively projected beyond the course beneath until they met in the middle. Temporary support using tim timber framework uh, called centering was required until the vault built simultaneously from each abutment was completed at the ground. So vaults uh, were similar to arches, but uh, these used to span long distances um and they were used to build corridors and uh, they were built in the same condition on the sides they were built and then slowly brought inside <clears throat> then you had domes uh, this can be thought of a shape formed by a rotation of an arch about its vertical axis uh, one again once again the the earliest domes were, were formed by corbling techniques which led to fairly pointed domes uh, the true domes had to be temporarily supported during construction, so when we when they were supported, you had a more hemispherical structure. But before that, because because they were corbelled with stone, they were a more pointy structures. Posts and lintels. So in stone buildings, uh, closed these space columns supported a web of stone lintels that in turn supported thinner lintels. Or stone slabs to form a flat roof so you had uh, these posts and then you have these lintels so this this beam beam is called the lintel and these are the posts or columns so these though the lintels are, are are supported on top of these columns and on top of these lintels are other smaller lintels that are supporting a roof uh, structure or a slab Bolt and domes. Uh, so, um, due to the development of this arch technology, uh, re development of arch replaced cumbersome stone and vulnerable timber lintels in walls with stone or brick masonry spanning wider openings. Hemispherical domes were set upon cylindrical walls or even more interestingly over polygonal or square supporting walls. So you can see they were they were built on top of support columns or lintel columns or, or these other arches. The supporting walls were made thick enough to contain the base of the dome or the thinner walls were used with lintels or arches spanning across the corners to support the dome. <clears throat> then came uh, the Gothic uh, construction. There three developments took place to convert heavy construction into lightness. There was arch ribs that were incorporated into roofs or ceilings, thus allowing the thickness of the masonry spanning between the ribs to be reduced. So um, they used rib structure instead of uh, the vaults and the domes. 
So that way you were able to put incorporate uh, the roof sealing the, uh, and making the thickness of the masonry spanning smaller. Then they had the pointed arch that was used instead of semicircle, this allowing the further reduction of weight by closing following thrust line. So in, they're following the thrust line closely. If you make it bigger, you have to make the structure bigger because the thrust line goes larger. But if you go make the thrust line smaller, you can make the structure lighter. Heavy supporting walls running across the thrust lines were replaced by flying buttresses and towers more aligned with the thrust. So here you can see on the sides they have these flying buttresses that support the actual structure itself. So this was a new technology that was developed and really helped uh, building structure. Then you had the single story load bearing buildings. Uh, contemporary single story load bearing buildings have been developed from simple ancient domestic buildings such as those built by the Romans in the first four centuries AD. Typical dwelling consisted of single openings, fronted rooms formed by masonry walls that supported a timber loft and roof covered with fired clay. So Romans were the first people or the first um, people to build single story load bearing buildings. Uh, the Romans, again, were also the first ones to start multi-story load-bearing buildings. A multi-story version of the small domestic dwelling was also built by Romans. These apartment blocks were five or more stories high. An apartment block, usually call, uh, known as an insula, was generated of rectangular plants subdivided into rooms. You had passageways, stairways, brick-faced concrete walls about one meter thick. The cellular nature of this plan ensured the adequ adequate stability against lateral forces of wind and earthquake. Uh, contemporary masonry elements. Um, we're going to do this in the next, so I'm going to do the introduction in two parts. For now, we're going to do part one. Uh, we're going to do the contemporary masonry elements and forward in the next one. Okay. Thank you guys for watching.